Aloha and welcome to Tough Love with Loretta Chen, where Hawaii's changemakers talk tough on the islands they love. Now our guest today is a CEO and inventor of those why didn't I think of that products. She's also a human trafficking activist, a motivational speaker, a life coach, and author of Jumping Jack, a preschool book to address hyperactivity. And new to Hawaii, she's currently an early college counselor for Leeward Community College. A Philly native, she believes youth should be encouraged to take advantage of the opportunities in their communities to achieve their dreams. Please welcome Sarita Washington. Hello, Hello. good morning. Thank you for making it here in crazy traffic. <laughs> Aloha and mahalo. Thank you so much for this opportunity to share about these important topics we're going to address today. Yeah, you know, I met you and I thought, gosh, you have so much spunk. <laughs> you know, people have often spoken to me and said, my God, Loretta, your, your resume is so eclectic. And then I meet you. I mean, your resume is so diverse, right? I mean, I thought I was a multi-hyphenate until I met you. Mm -hmm. So share with us what's it like being you for a day? I mean, juggling all these like 20,000 things that you're doing. Well, you know, that's so interesting because <laughs> I tend not to think that mine is such a unique uh, perspective. Right. So many people have to work more than one job or have more than one revenue stream. As a matter of fact, there were recent statistics about that reporting that there are 13 million um, individuals, citizens throughout the country who are working more than one job. And we yeah. know that number is even higher here in Hawaii. Right. Now, right. for me, it's kind of started out as um, a necessity, right? right? Thinking about how to make the bills kind of yeah. come together, yeah. Yeah, but bills. also thinking about what are the best ways to use your talents to do so. Right. So that you're not wasting time, you're actually um, working on self-improvement and empowerment, which yeah. is really important yeah. to me. No, and, and, and I'm with you, right? But, but you know, do you think that sometimes people will judge, and people always judge, right? Mm -hmm. And that's why these programs are important to, to dismiss those, those myths. Do you think that sometimes people will tend to take you less seriously because they're like, oh, yeah. she's a jack of all trades or Jill of all trades and a mess or mistress of none? Thank do you, you for that, that correction. What do you do? <laughs> yeah, it's very easy for someone to say, how can you do all of these right. things and do them well? well? And the fact is, when you find um, ways to spark that creativity for yourself and you're doing things that are within your realm of skill set and your interests and in a spiritual kind of way, something that you feel called to do, yeah. then you're likely to be successful. Yeah. So let me start with my background is mental health. Right. And I've worked for 20 years as a mental health professional, specifically working with youth and children in foster care as well and families. And so when we talk about the first multi-hyphen, uh, my, my book that I wrote, Jumping Jack, I wrote it out of frustration. And a lot of what we're going to talk about today comes from kind of wanting to share with the world. So when we think about multi-hyphenate things, I think it also comes from this idea that you feel called to share something Which of yourself. Which also means you're, you're multi-frustrated about many things <laughs> and you turn that adversity and that frustration into creative energy. There you go. There you, because either you can sit there and do nothing and be frustrated right. about it, right. or you can do something. So the question to ask yourself always is, what can I do to address this issue? Yeah, and there's so many people that want to go out there and do what you do. But I think, you know, it's tough love. Uh, you know, it's, it's a program that, address, uh, that addresses tough issues. So share with us, I mean, some of the challenges about getting those products out there. I mean, there, there's yeah. there's R&D, right? There's yeah. product development, there's warehousing. I mean, yeah. share with us the, yeah. the, 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 yeah. the dirt. Yes, yeah. okay, so let's start with even going back to the book. The right. book that I wanted to write is about a rabbit who may be hyperactive, may have a diagnosis of ADHD, but we never mentioned that in the story because I was frustrated that so many parents were bringing their kids to me for therapy saying, fix him, he is ADD. Number one, your child is not as diagnosis. Number two, we don't even know if that's a diagnosis. Number three, let's take a look at what strengths your child has. So how to put that all in a book. But then when you write a book, and there's so many women out there who have ideas for books and for stories, and getting into the publishing industry used to be really hard. Now, of course, we have self-publishing that, make that makes that a little bit easier. So when we talk about research and development, where do you find an illustrator for a book? How do you put it together? How do you make sure that it's a message that will be well-received? But when you have that idea and you do the research and the information is out there, 
This, this is the beautiful part about living right now. Right. When you and I were in college, yes. if we wanted to research something, what did we have to do? Oh my goodness, it would take forever, <laughs> yes, right? You yes. go to the library, you probably got to go talk to people. I mean, you literally got to go pound the streets. Exactly, I mean, exactly. so much more hyper-connected. Do you remember having to get out the yellow pages and flip through oh, the yellow pages goodness. to find I something? I a lot of people that have no idea what the yellow pages are. Like, exactly. they have no idea what the yellow exactly. pages are. Exactly. So here with YouTube University, where you can find a video about almost anything, where you can find a podcast about anything. There's no reason to be uninformed. Yeah. So that leads me to the development of my product and my company. Another right. frustration. Right. So one day I happened to be in the shower, right. taking a shower, and I had two shower caps on my head. <laughs> two. One in the front, one in the back, because I had all this hair. So <laughs> my husband looks at me, he's Babe, why do you have these two shower caps right on, on your head? Right and I said, because I can't find one yeah. that will fit all oh, this yeah. hair. And yeah. he said, what are you talking about? What do you mean you can't? But if you look at the average size of a shower cap, right. go to any hotel, any right. spa, any location, you'll find that it's the traditional plastic, mm -hmm. small, you know, if you have a larger head circumference, right. it won't right. fit, or just thicker hair. Right. And so... He said, you know, I, that looks like something that's just a problem. I said, it is a problem. Yeah. And he said, well, why don't you fix it? Yeah. And I thought about it for a minute. And I thought, huh, maybe I huh. should. Oh, fix that. So, so let's talk about that. So how did that start? Because yeah. obviously, I, I want our, our listeners and our viewers to know that it's not easy. You don't no. just think of an idea like, oh, it just happens. I watch a video and it happens. <laughs> Tell us like how that process is like and, and, yes. and, and make it grueling so we know that it's not easy. Huh. There's some trial and error, definitely. So prior to that, Again, thinking about multi-hyphenates and multi-revenue streams, my husband and I looked into starting a private label company. Let me exp explain what pri private labeling is. So private labeling would be if you come up with a product idea that you'd like to kind of tweak. It already exists. You don't have to file a patent for it. Our first product that we came up with was a bath pillow. It would be like if you want to kind of lay back in the bathtub and um, support your neck and right. have a luxurious experience. Now that already existed, but the thought is, how can I make this better? What can I do in order to make this a more enjoyable experience for the customer? And so we researched it, YouTube University and podcasts and books and everything else. And we jumped into the private labeling uh, business, which involved finding the right manufacturer for the product. It involved figuring out a name for the product, how to market the product, how to uh, make sure that that product can get from the source of the manufacturer to we sell on Amazon. So Amazon's warehouse, Amazon has a self-fulfilling uh, warehouse where uh, we don't have to ship out our orders to our customers. They will ship our order for right. us. Right. And so figuring out that whole system. And I can tell you that that first product, while it was manufactured well, it was also a failure. Right. It was a failure because... We like failures. <laughs> we, like to, we like to learn from our failures. Right? Definitely. How else do you learn? Definitely. So it was called the Serenity Now Bath Pillow. Why? Because I watched too much Seinfeld. And so <laughs> George Costanza would always yell, Serenity Now. And so I thought that was great. And um, it, again, very well manufactured, but it was heavy to ship. Mm -hmm. And so because it was heavy to ship, then that left us with an exorbitant shipping fee, which means that we kind of priced ourselves out of the market with regard to the product. Mm -hmm. And so we learned a lot through that experience, thinking about if we come up with another product, we have to make sure that it's something that's transportable. But we also learned our strengths. My strength being that I can write the heck out of an ad, you know, for sure. a product. My strength being that I know that it's important to give your customers something yeah, yeah. in exchange for their purchase. Yeah. So I always include a free gift with almost every purchase that I that I right. sell. Right. And so we learned a lot, but that was actually a failure. It was yeah. not easy. And sure. so it's very easy to give up if you don't see the results, especially now this is the problem also with podcasts, YouTube, and all of this, yeah. it'll be the people who are, oh, I'm making $30,000 a month selling right. on Amazon, right? Do not. That's marketing. <laughs> exactly. Do not, do not fall believe. for the hype. Yes. Because while yes. they may be making that now, the fact of the matter is they probably had one or two stumbles along the oh, way. one or two is a huge understatement. Exactly. Yeah. Before they came up with Absolutely. their thing. And so it was during this phase that we were developing the bath pillow that I had this frustration with the shower cap. Yep. Now, mind you, this turned out to be our most successful product. Wow. And it was born out of 
Frustration and the need to solve a problem. Right. We say necessity is the mother of invention. Oh, yeah. No kidding. Look at you <laughs> with that little cap. <laughs> And that's, that's so the cute. second product that I came out with. That is my sleep bonnet. And that came from my customers. So ah. you, it's called listening to your customer feedback. So my shower cap that I developed for right. all of that hair that you see oh, in front of you that, that would right. not fit I, inside. I, I never have that problem. I have like limp <laughs> Asian girl hair. Look at that. Like. No, but your hair is gorgeous. And I got to tell you how I'm addressing no, it, that way. population as well. Yeah. Yeah. So initially it came from my own, my own frustration with um, what was available on the market. But then I also had to do my research. Yeah. What's the problem with plastic shower caps? Well, mm -hmm. they're carcinogenic. Plastic is carcinogenic. Right. And it is not good for the environment. And right. it doesn't last right. long. And if yeah. we're looking for something sustainable. that will be sustainable, that people can keep for a longer period yeah. of time, and I want to be a good steward, a good citizen yeah. in our, you know, in our, our global environment, then that's very important. Right. So I thought about the material that it should be made out of. Yeah. We came up with vinyl. Vinyl is very sustainable. Right, right. And then I decided, okay, what's the other problem? Right. Well, a lot of times your hair can get frizzy. Right. If you have an updo for a right. fancy wedding, right. and let's say the wedding is Saturday, you get your hair done Friday, what are right. you going to do in the shower? Exactly. So exactly. I lined it with satin. And then the last thing is your hairstyle changes. Your hair may be straight today, right. and then tomorrow you may have all of these curls in your hair. Exactly. And so I wanted to make it adjustable. So thinking about what it is that you can do and how your idea can be different from what's on the market. How does it solve a problem? Right, exactly. And that was my question. How can this shower cap responsibly solve a problem? So just very quickly, I mean, it just cut you in there because we we're just going to go for a break really sure. soon. I mean, you've set up an e-commerce company, right? And, yeah. and, and we all know now that brick and mortar stores are on its way out. But, but what, what do you think, you know, as, a, as, a, as an entrepreneur, what do you think is the future of retail in like 90 uh, seconds? Yeah, the future of retail yeah, in 90 seconds. The, we know that it's book. becoming more automated. You can go into Whole Foods now and just, you know, check yourself out and walk out with using your Amazon account. You don't even have to go through the checkout line anymore right in some stores. Yeah. And so this idea that definitely um, we want to support our small brick and mortar mom and pop totally. shops because totally. they need that support. We yeah. don't, they have a place in our community for sure. Yeah. But at the same time, there's a space for entrepreneurs like me who say, hey, listen, I can't open up a whole store to sell one shower cap, but yeah. you know what I can do? I can create a space online for that. And yeah. so I think as a society, there's a place for both. Yes. Are we moving more towards the I need to get it now yeah. kind of model? Yeah. For sure. But definitely there's a place for our support for our small mom and pop shops. Yeah, no. And, and, and we have so many other interesting topics to get to, because one of the other things I really want to chat about, too, was about uh, th this this idea of you know how it was out of necessity right there, there was just no products out, out there for for girls mm -hmm. like you and mm -hmm. we're going to talk about how like in today's day and age we now have a little bit more of of, of, of that room yeah um but also the other thing i really wanted to address is also the fact that you're human trafficking activists yeah. and uh, when we come back from our break um i really want to address those issues because um i mean of late in the news it's been dominating the headlines about the recent human trafficking incident in, in Essex in London. So mm -hmm. I wanted to get your take on that. Um, so stay tuned, everybody. We'll going for a break, and we will be right back. Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines. I was the head coach for the Punahou Boys varsity tennis team for 22 years, and we we're fortunate to win 22 consecutive state championships. This show is based on my book, which is also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about leadership, creating a superior culture of excellence, achieving and sustaining success, and finding greatness. If you're a student, parent, sports or business person, and want to improve your life and the lives of people around you, tune in and join me on Mondays at 11 a.m. as we go beyond the lines on Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. Aloha. I'm Keisha King, host of At the Crossroads, where we have conversations that are real and relevant. We have spoken with community leaders from right here locally in Hawaii and all around the world. Won't you join us on thinktechhawaii.com or on YouTube on the Think Tech Hawaii channel. Our conversations are real, relevant, and lots of fun. I'll see you at the crossroads. Aloha. Welcome back, and we're speaking with multi-hyphenate CEO, inventor, human trafficking activist, motivational speaker, life coach, author, and early college counselor at Leeward Community College, Sarita 
Washington. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, we're still facing with human trafficking issues. I mean, the, 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 the public service ad that we did was for sex trafficking, but I just, I know you're a human trafficking expert. So let me just share with you, I mean, what mid, um, headline news recently was this high profile humanitarian tragedy that saw 39 people dead in a refrigerated lorry trailer in Essex about three weeks ago, right? Most of the victims were, were from a province in, in, in Vietnam and, and authorities are investigating obviously a, a human trafficking ring. Mm -hmm. uh, smuggling Vietnamese people to, to Britain. Um, and I shared with you during the break that I, I spent time volunteering in this child sex trafficking center in Cambodia with girls between the ages of 8 to 18. Some of them are younger because they're children of sex trafficking workers, right? And one of the things that's heartbreaking uh, that I learned was that when I first got there, I thought, oh, the barbed wires are there to keep the bad guys out. Duh. Mm -hmm. But then I soon learned it was also to keep the girls in because they felt like that was your only... It was the only trade they know, and they would rather go out and do that again. And it's the same thing that kept those young men and women taking on this treacherous journey, going on that lorry trailer, knowing the perils that they might face, and they're still doing it, mm -hmm. right? So I'm not going to ask you for a solution today, because I know it's rough, but tell me how it is for you as a human uh, uh, trafficking activist. I mean, where are we now? I mean, we've been talking about this for years. Where are we now? Well, where we are right now is that we need more education, point blank period. You would think that most people are aware, for example, of the difference between sex trafficking and labor trafficking, but right. they are not. Exactly. Um, you would think that we are at a point where we can address our biases mm -hmm. with regard to individuals who are sex trafficked. So, for example, it's much easier for me to be prejudiced against you if I think you're a prostitute versus a victim of sex trafficking. Or labor, yeah. And so, of yeah. Wages, yeah. But even if you think about labels and titles. Totally. So again, there's a judgment mm -hmm. that comes with the word prostitution, and it suggests that you're a willing participant in the work. And while there are sex workers mm -hmm. who do participate in that work, for the most part, individuals who are in that line of work are actually being um, taken advantage of, and they are um, victims or survivors of sex trafficking. So there's a psychology to human trafficking overall, labor trafficking and sex trafficking, that we just don't understand as a society. And so that education, understanding the, the psychology of it, how does a so-called pimp get someone to go along with what it is that he's proposing? I mean, when, when, when I worked in Cambodia, some of them gave an anecdote. I mean, I want to get your take on it, but a lot of it, I mean, there's so many reasons, but a lot of it is truly poverty and ignorance. One of the, one of the things that I, I learned was, you know, I, I went to ask them, and they said, yeah, they, usually some of these pimps, right, they will sort of spy upon the village. They know that, okay, mm -hmm. this villager, for example, has two pretty daughters. So mm -hmm. I would typically strike after there's a typhoon, a disaster, go to this, um, you know, old gentleman and woman and say, hey, you know, uh, let me give you some money. I'm going to give you a loan, a little mm -hmm. micro loan, mm -hmm. you know, and then you pay up. And of course, the young, that old farmer person says, okay, sure, they're, they're illiterate. They say, okay, sure. Mm -hmm. And then after that, they're unable to pay. As mm -hmm. always, the interest goes up. And next thing they know, a couple of months later, same guy comes and says, hey, you can't pay the interest. I beat you up, you know, or I'm going to take your daughter and she's just going to go work. So a lot of it is, mm -hmm. is so institutionalized, and it's mm -hmm. a whole cycle. Mm -hmm. you know, as a human trafficking activist, like how do we begin to unravel these big institutionalized systems? Right? We need to eradicate poverty. We need to educate yeah. people. Yeah. We need to eradicate ignorance. Yeah. How do we begin to unpack yeah. that? What are some steps that we can take? I mean, so, give us steps that we can take. Give us a roadmap, a guideline. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had the answer. Know. You know, the step that I'm taking is by providing education to the community. We understand that it's a global issue and a local issue. That same story that you shared, we would find parallels with a young girl right here in the city, if right. we were able to right, talk right. with her yeah. about how she's, you know, um, basically doing this because she feels like she has to in order to survive. Right. Um, and so there's looking for parallels and not just saying, oh, that's them over exactly. there doing that, but exactly. saying, no, this is a global issue and we're all responsible exactly. for it. The other thing is that there are nonprofits and programs. So there's one uh, called Kiva that 
provides legitimate microloans to women right. who are trying to start businesses in other countries. And you can actually provide donations to this organization to allow for that. Right. So looking for nonprofits that are legitimate, that are supporting women in business, just like what we're talking about here, yeah. starting off with a textile company or totally. starting off with something mm -hmm. small, making crafts, mm -hmm. creating a way for a woman to be economically empowered mm -hmm. so that she doesn't feel like she has to use her body in order to support right. herself right exactly exactly and and uh, you know you know I, I teach in the word as well and, and I surf the, the Waianae community and you know my students tell me that you know they they have had to be in a sex trade as well because you know to make ends meet I mean like you're saying it's right here in our community we often like to think that it's somewhere else some foreign exotic country but it happens usually right no. in our backyard. No. Yeah, right? and actually the most vulnerable victims of human trafficking include foster care um, yes. youth. Yes. So youth Absolutely. who are aging out of foster care and don't have necessarily the means or the understanding. And again, the psychology of those who prey on them. Yes. You mentioned the man in the village who's looking to see who might oh, be a yeah. target. Same thing here. There's somebody looking to see who might be vulnerable. Yeah. Um, they're looking for, you know, girls who might have dad issues. They're looking for girls who don't feel attractive. They're even exactly. on social media looking to see if you're not getting enough likes on your photo. That's right. And then they'll and creep they into your, your direct messages to say, hey, well, you didn't get enough likes on that picture, but I think you're gorgeous. It's just starting out in these small, insidious ways. Yes. So as a community, it's important that we're informed about it. And and so I use my background in mental health and social services to try to give back to the community in this way with regard to human trafficking, educating about the difference between labor and sex trafficking. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, just before the break, I mean, one of the things that, that, that you raised, too, was that as an African-American woman, you just felt like, you know, there are just not enough products that address your needs. Yeah. I mean, today Rihanna's Fenty makeup line is just making a blast, right? Yes. LVMH is like, I think, collaborating, acquiring her line. I mean, it's about time that people said, hey, there are like populations of the, the community that we need to look at. And yeah. I always found the term, you know, woman of color or man of color a really funny term because isn't white a color, like, right? <laughs> it's like, why am I off color and you're not off color? Like you're yeah. transparent. Or I just found it weird. But, but the point is, where do you see this taking us right i mean it's an yeah. exciting time uh, how do we get more women and men alike yeah. out there to go out there and say we want to go create products for us we yeah. really want makeup for our skin yeah. we want yeah. makeup that suits us i mean how do you feel growing up when yeah. you had no makeup shades that would no. fit your skin you're right i mean i remember buying my first foundation i was so orange i probably looked like a muppet <laughs> like it really was not something that matched my skin tone right. at all i couldn't find pantyhose remember having to wear pantyhose oh i couldn't God. find any that oh, were flesh me. colored even for right? Me, right what are nude was like <laughs> what are nude or flesh colored pantyhose i always looked a little dusty or gray and so this idea that you can go into even a store today, any um, big box store, yeah. walk in and look for hair care products for black women specifically. Yeah. Yeah. We might get three shelves right. in Walmart to support our products. And again, it's very difficult. So, yeah. but that creates opportunity. Exactly. Do you know that, for example, the dishwasher was invented by a woman? Um, there had been dishwashers before, but they used scrubbers. A woman came up with the idea that we need high pressure water in order to solve this problem. Right. The disposable diaper was invented by a woman. Yeah, yeah. And she went to men to pitch the idea, and they thought it was stupid. And so she kept going with it and right. then sold it directly to Saks Fifth Avenue. Yeah. And so it has to do with believing in your dream. You know, this is my shower cap, and I use it every day. I love and it. So I believe I believe in my product. It's actually um, very easy to put on. I put all my hair in it. I can actually take and um, you know adjust it the That's way I want. Cute. And it's cute. And guess what? I had a customer contact me who had the shower cap over a year and say, hey, listen, I'd like to get another one. You have a warranty. Can I get another I one? one? And we certainly would. But I've had customers keep their shower cap yeah. for more than a year. So talk about giving back to the yeah. community, making it global, yeah. but also coming up with ideas that you feel support your vision. And so from that shower cap, I was able to, as I mentioned, listen to my customers. Yeah. I develop 
soaked totally. a sleep bonnet because I had some customers sleeping in their shower cap. Oh my it's gosh. a shower cap, That's but right. I read That's my right. reviews. That's right. My reviews said, can I sleep in this? I right. said, no, but right. let me make something you can sleep in. Right. So I came out with that. But it also has to do with how you design your product, right. how you design your packaging. Right. I could just put this in a piece of plastic, yeah. but does it look like something that you'd want to exactly. spend money on? Exactly. Now when you get this in the mail, you're thinking, oh, I have, what is this? This is a little fancy. Yeah. And it's a sleep bonnet. Right. It's nothing. You don't have to come up with something that's earth shattering right. in right. order it's, to it's be the day -to -day. able to, to solve the day-to-day -day issues right it. here and now. Yeah. So in just like 60 seconds or less, I'm always challenging my, my guests, okay. right, to, to, to share with us something that will take away from us, right? Mm -hmm. Like in 60 seconds or less, tell us if there is one thing you want us to remember, uh, you know, about you being an entrepreneur and human uh, trafficking activist, but what is it? What would be your key takeaway that we'll walk away today saying, yeah, I'm going to remember that. That's a good you thing to with these gotcha questions. Yeah, I like okay. all these gotcha questions. Now it's like 30 seconds. All right, <laughs> so the one thing I'd want for folks to take away yeah. is the idea that you should feel empowered to make change for yourself and for yeah. your community. Yeah. If you have an idea, really look into investigating it. If you have an idea about giving back to the community in some way, yeah. look into investigating that. But yeah. do not feel ashamed that you have to have more than one revenue stream. Instead, tap into your inner strength and your resources and have that revenue stream work within those uh, avenues that's and realms. That's right, and never to give up, especially when it's hard. I mean, that's exactly what you're saying, right? You got especially it. Especially when it's hard. So, well, thank you all so much for watching Tough Love with Loretta Chan, because you know what? Tough times don't last. This girl here definitely a walks a talk, uh, but tough people do. So join us next week where we speak to mayoral candidate Kimberly Pine. See you next time.